Hello and welcome to Terrestrial Broadcast Transmission, another in our series of educational videos from IET Media. IET Media is the Institute of Engineering and Technology's technical network for engineers involved in all forms of media, and today's presentation is a joint production with the Antennas and Propagation Technical Network. Our presenter today is Richard Plum. Welcome to this webinar on Terrestrial Broadcast Transmission. Terrestrial broadcasting has now been around for uh, almost 100 years um, and in that time although uh, the transmission infrastructure has evolved from the, the, the wooden lash-ups used by the early pioneers through the, uh, the grand art deco buildings of the uh, 1930s and 40s to today's all digital systems, uh, many of the underlying principles and practices uh, show a surprising amount of continuity. Um, and I'm hoping this webinar to give a bit of an introduction to some of the engineering and planning issues involved in, uh, in terrestrial broadcast networks. I'm going to talk a bit about um, the characteristics of terrestrial broadcasting um, and in particular spend a little bit of time looking at how we define uh, the wanted signal to give the, uh, the required uh, quality of service and uh, the necessary performance, uh, which will also involve considerations of uh, protection against interference uh, and the balance between protecting uh, a wanted signal um, to give sufficiently high quality of service whilst also um, using the spectrum in a, uh, the most efficient manner possible. And that will lead into a discussion of national and international planning issues. Um, and then I'll talk a bit about some of the practical aspects of um, network planning, including uh, the definition of propagation models and the use of those models uh, to plan services, how antennas are implemented for different broadcast systems, and some of the uh, network issues specific to uh, more recent digital networks, uh, and conclude uh, by looking very briefly uh, at where broadcasting, terrestrial broadcasting in particular, might be going uh, in the future. As I say, broadcasting has shown a surprising degree of continuity in, uh, in some of the techniques and methods used, despite the ever upward uh, trend in frequency from the, uh, the long and medium waves used for the earliest AM radio networks uh, to VHF and UHF frequencies in search of uh, the higher bandwidths needed uh, for services such as television. And the growing complexity of the transmitted signal, um, initially adding subcarriers for service enhancements such as uh, colour TV and stereo radio, uh, and then to piggyback digital uh, services on top of analogue systems with things like teletext and um, RDS radio, and then the ultimate transition to all digital transmission systems. And of course, many of the transmission aspects are uh, common to other radio systems, but there are some particular characteristics of, uh, of broadcast networks, such as the fact that uh, you're aiming at a, a uniform coverage of often quite a wide area. And importantly, receiver systems aren't under the control of broadcasters uh, in any way. Even in, in cellular networks, um, there is at least handshaking between the network and the uh, the user equipment and the handsets so uh, the network can operate in a cooperative uh, and self-adjusting way and that's absent in in broadcast systems where you're launching a signal into space and hoping that the uh, the receiver equipment will provide an adequate quality of service uh, and if it doesn't of course the broadcaster can expect to be on, on the receiving end of, uh, of negative feedback from the audience uh, and then the third aspect I've highlighted here is that uh, broadcasting has, has suffered and also benefited from the fact that it's generally had a very high uh, profile, both in, uh, in sociological terms and in, in political terms. Topics I'm not going to cover here uh, include uh, HF broadcasting, shortwave broadcasting, which although fascinating in the way um, it uses the, uh, the ionosphere, with all its vagaries to uh, transmit signals over long distances is, uh, is now undergoing a uh, steep decline. 
Um, I'm not going to touch on satellite broadcasting um, direct home, uh, but only in relation to its use for um, providing feeds to transmitter sites. And I'm not going to talk about cable or fibre distribution, although they're undoubtedly terrestrial systems. Um, I'm only going to talk here about uh, the use of radio to distribute signals. And it's interesting to note that uh, back in the 1920s, the first engineer of the, uh, the BBC thought that radio transmission was a bit of an unsatisfactory stopgap and that uh, cable distribution of, um, of radio signals would uh, was much to be preferred and would ultimately uh, be the method adopted. I think he'd have been quite surprised to see just uh, how long lasting uh, radio uh, transmission systems have proved to be. So it seems pretty simple to, uh, in principle, to set up a, a system for point to area transmission of radio signals. Uh, one would simply put a transmitter in the, uh, the middle of the area that you're trying to serve. Um, and if it's a, a VHF transmitter, you might want to put it on the highest ground. Uh, if it's a, a low frequency transmitter using ground waves, which we'll come to later, you might want to uh, locate it in an area of uh, high ground conductivity and then use an omnidirectional transmit antenna to send the signals in all directions. But we need to uh, specify the details of the system in terms of uh, power and antenna gains. Uh, so the first thing we need to understand is uh, how much signal is the listener going to require to provide a usable service? Uh, and our starting point there is probably going to be uh, the type of modulation. Uh, these days it'll inevitably be, uh, almost inevitably be digital. Uh, it might be analog still in some cases. And this is generally expressed uh, for broadcast services anyway, uh, in terms of electrical field strength. Uh, usually expressed as uh, decibels relative to one microvolt per meter. And expressing the coverage in terms of field strength implies that we must assume something about the uh, gain and efficiency of a typical receiver antenna. Uh, and we also need to define uh, the ultimate quality targets. What, what grade of picture, what definition of picture, what signal to noise ratio for a, an audio service or bit error rate for a digital service are we to provide and over what proportion of the area uh, and for what percentage of time. Uh, and we also need to allow for disturbances from uh, local electrical noise or from atmospheric uh, electrical noise. So even before we consider interference and um, complex uh, coverage targets, uh, even just setting up an omnidirectional uh, circular transmission system, uh, there's quite a lot to take into account. While in cellular networks, uh, base stations are limited not only by the, the coverage they can achieve, but also by the um, capacity they can provide to uh, a given number of subscribers in an area, uh, there's no such limit in broadcast transmission. So there's a very strong incentive to uh, erect very high power transmitters to cover as, as large a population as possible. Um, and this can be seen in the, uh, the graph below, which shows the, uh, the, the asotopic rise in uh, coverage of the UK uh, terrestrial television network. Um, and the purple line here shows that with uh, only around 40 transmitters, some 90% of the population was covered but that uh, progress was very much slower from that point on. And it required around a thousand relay transmitters to bring that coverage up to uh, uh, a point uh, beyond about 98% of the population. Uh, and you can see that uh, this involved a very large number of, uh, of very low power transmitters. So that the first few main stations that picked up the bulk of the population had uh, effective radiated powers shown on the, uh, the right hand axis uh, of a few hundred kilowatts, uh, whereas the network was completed with um, a very large number of, of tiny relay stations with uh, ERPs of, uh, of between a watt and 10 watts or so. If we're going to design a broadcast network, the starting point 
will be to uh, determine the uh, the strength of signal required at a receiver to give the, um, the listener or viewer the quality of service that's required. And the starting point for this would be to assume a receiver in ideal conditions, a stationary receiver, um, <clears throat> limited only by uh, local electrical noise, although that noise may be uh, maybe man-made noise and it may be increasing over time. Uh, that certainly seems to be the case at the moment with uh, more and more household devices, things like switch mode power supplies uh, emitting noise across a wide spectrum. Um, and then having defined uh, the wanted signal for that fairly simple case, we then need to allow for the fact that the receiver is going to be moving around, it's going to be suffering from shadow fading or location variability as it moves behind buildings and terrain features. It's going to be suffering from uh, fast multipath fading, um, typically characterized by Rayleigh distribution. Um, and most importantly, there'll be interference, both uh, perhaps from your own network, uh, from other stations of your own network, and uh, from other networks, which may be uh, in the same uh, the same country, the same area, or maybe very distant. And uh, these, this interference will be characterized by uh, protection ratios, which define for different modulation types and different systems, uh, the degree of interference that can be tolerated for certain quality thresholds. Uh, and finally, uh, we need to think about uh, the availability of the service, uh, not only in terms of location, but in terms of time, uh, particularly over over wide areas where uh, propagation effects can be significant. Uh, let's look at a couple of examples. And uh, the key thing here is, is not to focus on the details, um, but just to give a, uh, the intention is just to give a flavor of the, the sort of process that's adopted uh, in defining uh, reception targets for broadcast signals. For a first example, we'll um, consider the case of analog FM radio. And the starting point here is to uh, determine an audio signal to noise ratio that will give uh, an adequate quality uh, to the typical user. Um, and this would probably have been determined in the past by assembling a panel of uh, listeners and playing them a selection of program material from different sources, uh, deliberately degraded with uh, injected noise at different levels. Carrying out that sort of test uh, is a major topic in itself, and you also need to account for things such as the way noise can be weighted to represent the response of the, uh, the human ear and human perception. And nowadays, of course, most listening is probably in noisy environments such as kitchens or cars, but at one time, the expectation would have been that the audience were using high quality receivers and listening in a, a quiet location. Uh, and this implies a fairly demanding um, audio signal to noise threshold, maybe around 60 dBs or so. We now need to relate this signal to noise ratio to the power required at the, uh, the receiver input, uh, assuming a given receiver noise level. And uh, this depends on the, the modulation index, which in turn depends on the, uh, the deviation used, which is typically uh, 75 kilohertz or so, uh, if you ignore uh, the stereo and RDS radio data system subcarriers, and it also depends on the preemphasis that's applied. And this is um, this is the um, boosting of higher modulation frequencies uh, at the input of the transmitter to overcome the uh, the triangular noise characteristic that you get from an FM demodulator, uh, and is characterised in terms of the uh, time constant of the filter network used with uh, 50 microseconds being used in, uh, in most parts of the world. Plugging these numbers into the uh, expression on the right um, gives us a required RF signal to noise ratio of about 51 dBs. Uh, and if you then take um, uh, an assumed typical receiver thermal noise uh, figure, maybe 10 dBs or so, um, which might be chosen to represent a, a typical receiver or a worst case assumption, uh, we can then convert this, uh, the ratio of 51 dBs to an absolute power uh, in terms of uh, dBm.
By tradition, broadcast signal strength is usually expressed in terms of voltage, and the standard system impedance for radios and televisions is 75 ohms, which was originally chosen to give a good match to dipole antennas. So by Ohm's law, we therefore need a terminated voltage of around 38 dBs uh, with respect to one microvolt. For planning purposes, we need to express this as a field strength. Uh, for a service such as FM radio, where most receivers are going to be portable or mobile, it might be appropriate to assume a pretty low gain antenna, something like a dipole, um, where a rooftop Yagi antenna would give rather more gain and the uh, telescopic whip on a small portable radio might give rather less. And the voltage uh, available from a half wave dipole um, is given by um, through the effective length of the dipole, which converts from the, uh, the field strength to the unterminated voltage uh, for a given wavelength. So uh, at lower frequencies, your half wave dipole will be larger and will intercept more of the, uh, the electric field. And equally at higher frequencies, you've got smaller dipoles. So the effective uh, aperture of the antenna is less and the, uh, the voltage available from the antenna uh, correspondingly less. Uh, we also need to allow uh, a further 6 dBs for the effect of terminating the antenna into the matched load of the receiver. Uh, and when you take all this into account, you find that you need a, a minimum required field strength for a receiver with a dipole antenna and a, this noise floor we've assumed of 10 dBs uh, of around 44 dB microvolts per meter at a reference frequency around 95 megahertz. For a second example, a look at the case of um, digital terrestrial television transmitted using the, uh, the DVB-T standard. Um, and obviously, digital systems give you a lot more flexibility uh, and potential efficiency, and they allow us to trade the uh, transmitter power for bit rate or for robustness of reception. Um, so that, for instance, with the, um, the earliest digital TV transmissions, which had to uh, share spectrum with continuing analog transition, uh, transmissions before uh, analog switchover occurred, um, the emphasis was on providing a very robust signal to provide users with uh, uh, an assured quality of reception in the case when there was quite a lot of adjacent channel interference and where um, viewers' rooftop antennas were not necessarily optimized for the, uh, the channels used for the digital transmissions. Uh, and so um, the, uh, the modulation order was chosen to ensure uh, a very robust signal. But you can also um, have a trade-off between overall bit rate, um, so you can either transmit uh, a few very high quality channels or many channels of lower technical quality. And uh, this sort of trade-off has led to a lot of heated discussions, particularly um, in the context of the, the audio quality of, of DAB radio services. Um, so some people will always be urging uh, higher quality uh, pictures or audio, others will be keen to, um, to squeeze in as many uh, attractive services as possible into a given bandwidth. Uh, but the, uh, the, once again, we start with uh, defining the required carry to noise uh, level at the receiver. Uh, and this will depend on the, the modulation order, the code rate, the, the, the type of propagation channel that's expected. Um, and the current UK DVB-T services use a, a fairly high order modulation, 64 QAM, um, with the characteristics shown here. And for a good subjective uh, impression of uh, MPEG-2 coded pictures, uh, this is found to require a, a post Viterbi bit error rate uh, of around 2 times 10 to the negative 4. Um, and then you can relate the, uh, the bit error rate, which you might determine through, uh, through subjective testing um, of a wide range of different receivers and with a wide range of, um, of viewers. Uh, you might then link that uh, bit error rate to a particular uh, C to N ratio uh, using the modem curve, uh, such as the one uh, shown in this slide. And uh, here we can see that uh, 
our required uh, bit error rate of around 2 times 10 to the neg 4 uh, requires a C2N uh, of around 17 dBs uh, in a Ricean channel, the sort of uh, channel that you might expect uh, to be presented with if, uh, if reception is via a rooftop antenna. Again, we have to make some assumptions about the receiver noise power in the uh, in the bandwidth of a dBBT signal. Uh, and for a, a plausible modern receiver noise figure of around 7 dBs, uh, this gives you a particular noise power, neg 98 dBm. Uh, and you can use that and your C to N value from the modem curve to determine the minimum wanted power at the, uh, at the receiver. Uh, which in this case is, is around 81 dBm. Now that uh, 81 dBm required at the receiver uh, corresponds to, uh, to around 28 dB microvolts in a 75 ohm system, but we need to relate that to uh, the field strength we need to provide from our transmitter network. Um, and a dipole is obviously much smaller at UHF, and so it intercepts less of our field uh, it has an effective length of around uh, minus 16 dBs, so uh, dramatically less efficient uh, in terms of extracting energy from the field than our, um, our case uh, for VHF radio. And so if we were using a dipole <coughs> antenna, we'd need a pretty high field strength of uh, 50 dB microvolts per meter to give us the, uh, the required power at the receiver. But of course, uh, at UHF, we can easily make uh, relatively high gain antennas. So let's assume that viewers are using rooftop antennas uh, with an 8 uh, dB gain relative to a dipole, which would be typical for a, a small log periodic antenna, the type that's used these days uh, pretty generally. Um, allow for a couple of dBs of loss in the typical feeder run down to the house. Um, and this gives us then uh, a minimum wanted signal field strength uh, of around 42 uh, dB microvolts per meter. So we now know the field strength we need to deliver to an individual receiver, but the problem is we can't predict uh, field strengths on a per receiver basis. Uh, we can only predict the, uh, the median field within uh, a given area, a pixel perhaps of um, a few tens or hundreds of meters across. So we need to allow for the variability in field strength across that pixel. And uh, the variability is due to uh, largely to shadowing by, uh, by buildings, local terrain variations, small hills, trees, that sort of thing. Um, and many measurement campaigns over, over the decades have found that in general, the variability follows a, a log normal distribution. Uh, so just the, uh, the normal bell curve um, when the signal is expressed in, uh, in terms of dB microvolts per meter. And it's been found that the, uh, a standard deviation of around 5.5 dBs is often um, been selected for use in broadcast planning. And retrospectively, this has been found to, to, um, to correspond to the sort of location variability you see in uh, in around 90% of, of all uh, pixels, certainly in the UK. So if you want to build in uh, a margin to ensure that 95% of receivers within a, a given pixel uh, receive a satisfactory service, you need to uh, provide a margin with respect to the median signal of around 9 dBs, if only 70% or so require um, uh, an assurance of reception. Uh, that margin falls to around 3 dBs. Um, the lower figure might have been appropriate uh, in the days of analog reception, where um, quality of service falls off uh, fairly gradually as the, uh, the signal strength falls. But in the case of digital services, it's probably necessary to, um, to ensure a higher availability. So the 95% the or even higher availability would be, be appropriate. Um, and in the, uh, the case of the DTT uh, service we were just considering, uh, the required median field strength in a pixel might then become um, around 51 dB microvolts per meter to, uh, 
to give that 95% availability we were talking about. So now we can uh, be assured that we can deliver enough um, of the wanted signal to provide a decent quality of service at the receiver, uh, but we also need to think about sharing the spectrum. So in broadcast systems, the susceptibility uh, to interference is usually described in terms of protection ratio, uh, which is uh, the ratio usually given in dBs that uh, describes how much stronger than an interfering signal, the wanted signal must be to, uh, to deliver the required quality of service. And this will obviously vary with modulation types and, and uh, offset. So it's usually presented in the form of uh, a graph showing protection ratio on the y-axis and uh, offset uh, with respect to the wanted carrier frequency on the, uh, the y-axis. Uh, and it's specified the, uh, the ratio relates to the power of each signal in their, their own native channel uh, bandwidths. Uh, so the example on the right here uh, is for FM radio, and here we've got uh, four different curves relating to uh, different types of service. The M curves relate to uh, mono service, um, the S curves for stereo reception, um, and therefore the case of uh, steady interference and time varying interference due to um, atmospheric conditions. Uh, so generally, uh, will be interested in the um, the steady interference curves which represent the uh, the worst case and uh, we can see that at zero offset for the case of a stereo signal uh, interfered with by another stereo signal uh, we need a 45 db protection ratio the wanted signal needs to be 45 dbs more uh, than the interfering signal uh, and then as you increase the frequency separation between the two signals uh, after a, an initial rise at the, at the first standard channel offset of 100 kilohertz, the, uh, the protection ratio falls to about 33 dBs. Uh, by the time we get to 200 kilohertz, you only need to be uh, 7 dBs uh, greater than the interfering signal uh, for a reasonable quality of service. Uh, and then the protection ratio actually becomes negative at 300 kilohertz offset. So uh, at that wider separation, the interfering signal can actually be stronger uh, than the wanted signal uh, without disrupting the, uh, the quality of service. Uh, to take another example, um, the, the figure here shows the case of um, digital terrestrial television uh, to the DBBT standard being interfered with by um, LTE signals. Um, cellular signals uh, to, at various offsets. The offsets here are expressed in terms of UHF channel offsets. So these are eight megahertz intervals. And you can see this is a much more complicated graph, but um, some of the, uh, uh, the basic features are similar. The different colored curves here relate <coughs> to uh, different absolute powers of the signals. Normally protection ratios uh, just involve the relative powers and it's assumed that things are linear. But uh, there's a particular problem with uh, interference in the UHF band between TV receivers and, and LTE that some very non-linear effects can, uh, uh, can cause significant problems. You've very often got the case in this scenario where uh, a TV receiver may be very close to an LTE base station. And so that's what's being explored in this graph. Uh, with very strong um, LTE signals, the purple curve here, uh, causing significantly uh, greater interference due to, um, uh, due to driving the front end of the set into, into non-linearity. Uh, but you can see again that the highest uh, protection ratios are required for the uh, frequencies closest to the wanted signal. Uh, so here we've got, um, required protection ratios at um, one or two channels away of uh, minus 20, minus 30 dBs. So it might seem that this is a relatively relaxed uh, requirement, but unlike the FM 
uh, radio case, as I say, it's very likely that uh, a TV receive antenna might be quite close to an LTE macro cell. So you'll very often come across the case where um, the unwanted LTE signal could easily be 20, 30, or 40 dBs higher than uh, a DTT signal from a, a relatively distant TV transmitter. Uh, but you can see, as before, the protection ratio falls away uh, with frequency. So once you're 10 channels or so away, um, the protection ratio uh, can fall to uh, as little as minus 60 dBs. So the, the LTE signal at a large offset, an 80 megahertz or so offset, can be uh, 60 dBs or so greater than the wanted signal. Uh, another interesting artifact on this graph <coughs> is this uh, anomalous response here at um, uh, nine channels above the wanted frequency. Uh, and this is caused by the use of um, uh, a standard TV receiver architecture, which is a, a superhet uh, with an IF frequency of around 36 megahertz. And this corresponds uh, to an image channel relationship at, uh, at a nine channel offset. Uh, and that's what gives this spurious response here. It's an image channel response. Uh, most modern uh, TV receivers won't uh, show this response because the architecture generally uh, is now a, a zero IF or a near zero IF direct conversion uh, architecture rather than a, a standard superhead architecture. Now that we've defined our wanted signal requirements and we know about protection ratios, we can start to uh, draw up a plan uh, to provide the, the wanted degree of coverage from our broadcast network. The um, sketch below shows the field strength um, on a line between two transmitters, uh, transmitter one and transmitter two. And as you move away from transmitter one, obviously the field strength from that transmitter falls, but the field strength from the other transmitter, transmitter two, increases. Uh, and we know from our wanted signal requirements that uh, we have a particular um, field strength that uh, defines the noise limited coverage. But in practice, uh, broadcast systems are always uh, going to be interference limited uh, just because of the, uh, the demands on spectrum. Uh, so we assume that we have to take the uh, protection ratio uh, from the second transmitter into account. And this implies that the, uh, the service area of transmitter one will be limited by the interference from transmitter two, um, dictated by uh, the protection ratio that we looked at in the, the previous slide. So um, this is the uh, field strength uh, given by the protection ratio requirements to provide the service uh, quality we want from transmitter one. Uh, so the interference limited service radius is uh, almost always going to be lower than the noise limited service radius. Obviously, if we change the relative frequency separation of the two transmitters, we can expand this interference limited service uh, radius uh, to approach the noise limited service radius. But in general, um, if we had these two transmitters operating on the same frequency, there'd be a large sterilized area between them uh, where we'd need to provide coverage from a third or a fourth or a fifth transmitter. And so we start to uh, build up the concept of, um, of the matrix of transmitters that we're going to need to provide contiguous coverage uh, across any given area. The need to take account of protection ratios means that uh, a large number of uh, frequencies are generally needed if you're going to uh, plan a network to give contiguous geographical coverage, uh, particularly over a large area. Um, and partly because of the fact that uh, interference at uh, UHF and VHF frequencies can uh, propagate over very large distances uh, for small percentages of time. Uh, so if we're to protect our network for, for 90 or 95 or 99 percent of the time, we may have to allow for interference from transmitters uh, several hundred kilometers away. Um, so, for instance, the uh, UHF network in the UK, the analog network, required uh, 11 channels uh, to provide coverage uh, for each individual uh, program channel. Uh, 
And the, the same thing applies in traditional digital networks. Although the protection ratios are often smaller in the digital case, uh, it's still the case that um, if you've got uh, a nearby transmitter being interfered with by a more distant transmitter, the um, misalignment between the symbols will cause uh, intersymbol interference, as shown in the diagram below. In COFDM systems, we have the concept of a guard interval, which can uh, provide protection against either multipath, in, in perhaps in mountainous areas, we've got uh, delayed energy being scattered back from mountains or hills, uh, or for delayed signals from distant transmitters. Um, and this guard interval is implemented uh, by the use of a cyclic prefix, where each symbol uh, is preceded by um, an additional chunk repeated from the end of the symbol to effectively lengthen the transmitted time of each symbol. Um, so the symbol extends uh, beyond the receiver window used to detect the symbol. Um, and this means that for the penalty of uh, a somewhat reduced data rate, because you're using more of the uh, transmission frame time to transmit each symbol, um, you build in uh, a ruggedness against multipath. Uh, and this not only uh, allows uh, the system to be more robust in the presence of uh, reflected uh, interference, but it also allows uh, a single frequency network to be implemented, where if the uh, cyclic prefix, if the guard interval is long enough, uh, all the transmitters within a, a given geographical area can operate on the same channel, and the uh, power in each of their symbols will be added constructively. <clears throat> And there's a quite a complicated um, uh, set of algorithms used to um, to determine how the receiver window is positioned to uh, to maximise the uh, the useful power from the variety of symbols it seems from uh, potentially a large network of transmitters. Although the idea of a single frequency network then seems to offer the, yeah, the possibility of an end to uh, spectrum shortage and um, to do away with the need for frequency planning. It's not really a straightforward solution. Uh, signals beyond the guard interval can still cause uh, interference. So um, even if you sacrificed quite a lot of your channel capacity, maybe up to a quarter of the capacity in a DVVT system to allow for a, an inter-transmitter spacing of up to 67 kilometers or so, um, there's still a possibility that very long distance interference from tropospheric ducting or uh, other mechanisms uh, can exceed the, um, the guard interval and cause network problems. And there have certainly been some cases of uh, this sort of effect in, in parts of Europe in recent years where um, in summer months where there's been high pressure and uh, prolonged ducting, these sorts of problems have occurred and the, uh, the network has suffered outages in some areas. Um, and then a, a, a practical problem is making the transition uh, to a single frequency network. Uh, the problems of finding a single channel uh, available throughout a country or an area uh, that can be used for um, uh, to implement a single frequency network can be really difficult because historically international coordination has obviously always used uh, multi-frequency networks appropriate to analog uh, cases. So uh, a, a very considerable renegotiation potentially with multiple neighbours can be required to free up uh, one channel uh, for a DAB or DBBT uh, broadcast network for use in a single frequency basis. Anyone setting up a broadcast network is going to need to consider um, international coordination and domestic coordination uh, to make sure that there's no mutual interference on the, uh, the frequencies to be used. Uh, and for simple networks, something like a, a local FM radio station, this will probably already have been done uh, by the local administration. So uh, someone like Ofcom in the UK uh, will assign a particular site uh, transmitter power and uh, frequencies and other technical parameters uh, on the basis of uh, agreements that have already been made um, with other broadcasters, both nationally and internationally. Um, 
but the starting point for um, international coordination, whether it's done uh, in a pre-prepared way by the administration or, or in a very detailed way by um, a specific broadcast organization, uh, is likely to be a so-called regional plan uh, maintained by the ITUR in Geneva. And these plans uh, provide initial uh, starting point and then a framework uh, for the future growth and modification of the plan as broadcast networks expand uh, and new transmitters are added. Uh, and the box here shows uh, examples of a few um, current uh, and recent plans. Uh, one of the oldest was the, um, uh, the regional plan developed in Stockholm in 1961, which laid the basis for the expansion of uh, TV services at UHF frequencies throughout uh, Europe and beyond. Uh, Geneva 1984, uh, this plan still uh, dictates the use of uh, FM radio frequencies in Europe and Africa and a few other uh, neighboring areas. Uh, and most recently, the uh, Geneva 06 plan, 2006, um, set out the basis for the transition to, uh, to digital television at uh, VHF and, and UHF frequencies. Uh, and these plans are married, uh, managed by a body called the uh, Radio Communications Bureau, which is part of the ITU. Uh, and they do this through um, what's called an uh, International Frequency Information Circular, uh, which is an online set of forms that are completed if you want to uh, introduce new transmitters or, uh, or modify existing ones. As a starting point for planning, it's um, often assumed that uh, you have a, a hypothetical network of identical transmitters uh, distributed on a, a regular lattice, uh, and then frequencies are assigned uh, to each of these uh, notional transmitter sites on a, on a regular basis according to a simple algorithm. And then it's necessary, of course, to distort this lattice to fit in uh, with the actual uh, geometry of the network and the, uh, the geography of the area being planned. And uh, the rather blurry picture on the right here is taken from uh, the old Stockholm plan of uh, 1961, and it shows the way in which the uh, initial regular lattice network was distorted. Um, and you can see these, these lines here, which uh, represent the modification of the lattice to suit uh, the actual geography of the situation. And it's interesting to note that the, uh, the ghost of the, um, the Stockholm plan can still be seen in the um, assignments to uh, digital TV in Europe, uh, even after 60 years, although the, uh, the original plan covered uh, the whole of the UHF band, including frequencies that are currently assigned uh, now to mobile services at the, uh, the upper end of the band in the so-called 700 and 800 megahertz digital dividend bands. Um, there are still assignments associated with those uh, that were originally made uh, over 60 years ago uh, that can be seen in the, uh, in, in the current iteration of this plan in the, uh, the Geneva 06 plan. One important distinction that uh, is made is between so-called uh, allotments and assignments. Now, as we've seen with these hypothetical plans, even when you've distorted the, um, uh, the assumed lattices to take account of geography, uh, it's very likely that you won't know the exact position of a future transmitter. Obviously, site acquisition uh, is a complicated process uh, involving uh, very detailed local planning considerations. So it's quite likely that um, you'll only be able to think in terms of a transmitter site intended to serve a, a given region. And so initial planning is often based on, uh, on the concept of uh, frequency allotments, where you uh, assign a frequency to uh, a generic area. And rather than model this on the basis of a, a specific site, you model it in terms of um, field strengths not to be exceeded at the, uh, the boundaries of this um, allotment area. And then uh, at a later point in the planning, 
administrations are able to convert uh, such allotment areas to specific frequency assignments at uh, particular transmitter sites once you know the exact geographic location. Um, and it's at this point that uh, things like antenna radiation patterns and uh, precise EIRPs or ERPs will be uh, specified and associated with those assignments. In uh, some cases where the uh, expected eventual transmitter density is fairly high, for instance, in a, a single frequency network for uh, something like DAB broadcasting, um, the concept of a reference network may be used where you um, tile uh, the whole of an allotment area with a, a repeating uh, pattern of transmitters at a given uh, transmitter separation distance uh, so as to um, give a more accurate representation of the, uh, the amount of potential interfering power that may be exported uh, from a given allotment area. Even for very high level planning for the purposes of uh, international coordination, we're going to need propagation models to describe the way in which field strength uh, falls away with distance for a given transmitter. And uh, more detailed models are going to be needed when we start to look at uh, the selection of individual transmitter sites and the, uh, the detailed pattern of local coverage uh, and interference prediction. Uh, and in the earlier days of uh, broadcasting, the only way to uh, to do such predictions was by um, laborious uh, individual testing of specific sites. So uh, teams of engineers would erect uh, temporary masts or fly uh, tethered balloons, um, and then a vehicle would explore the local area to uh, to map the field strength in the region. And these sorts of measurements were quickly uh, used to draw up uh, simple empirical uh, models generally in the form of um, graphs of, of field strength versus distance as in this this early ITU document and this simply shows the way in which over over a scale of hundreds of kilometers the field strength from a, a transmitter of a given power in this case uh, one kilowatt ERP uh, could be expected to decline um, and these just show the uh, the median values of field strength over a, a wide area. So you're smoothing out all the um, all the uh, the local variability that you'd see in the real world. Uh, but even for these simple models, it was recognised that there's uh, a large amount of uh, a variation with time uh, over these longer distances in the VHF and UHF range due to uh, variations. Of refractive index in the troposphere, so you can see that the uh, the one percent time curve uh, predicts significantly greater field strengths than uh, than the median uh, percentage time curve and the uh, the lower curve here. And this very simple model, um, this was the first model uh, used at uh, VHF frequencies by the ITU, and um, this went on to become. Uh, a quite well-known model recommendation uh, 370, P370 of the ITU, uh, which has further evolved into recommendation P1546 and is still uh, still has the form of a set of curves. So usually it's implemented as a, a computer prediction method these days um, and is still very widely used for uh, particularly for international coordination. These sorts of uh, empirical models um, quickly became more detailed um, as more input data was available and became tailored for uh, computer implementation from the, uh, the 1960s onwards. Uh, and at every stage in this process, the accuracy available from the models has been constrained by uh, the input data available, um, which for uh, lower frequencies, uh, the most important input is probably knowledge of the ground conductivity which determines the uh, the propagation uh, of the ground wave at, uh, at lower frequencies or at uh, higher frequencies of course the uh, the details of the terrain uh, and also the clutter on the terrain so information about local buildings and vegetation and the amount of uh, attenuation and screening um, and the statistics of that attenuation um, due to ground cover uh, become very important and several uh, models have been standardized by the ITU for use in, um, in international planning and bilateral coordination. I've already mentioned 
the empirical model of, of P1546. Um, but uh, more recently, um, semi-physical models that take into account the, um, the diffraction uh, across different types of terrain and the, uh, the variability of the, uh, the atmosphere uh, have also been developed and uh, the model primarily used uh, for broadcasting is a recommendation P1812 uh, and this uh, semi-physical model uh, for VHF and UHF um, propagation. And apart from the, uh, the variation in signal strength with geography, uh, which is the thing we most often think about, we also need to uh, predict the variability, uh, particularly of interference with time. Um, and for the lower frequencies, uh, this implies modeling the behavior of the, uh, the different layers of the ionosphere uh, to understand how um, propagation changes between, uh, particularly between daytime and nighttime. Uh, and at the higher frequencies, uh, tropospheric effects, particularly uh, changes in the refractive index, can give rise to um, very long distance propagation um, of, uh, of interference over paths of, uh, of tens or hundreds of kilometers. And uh, this needs to be accounted for statistically in these models. I'm going to stop by talking uh, fairly briefly about um, LF and MF broadcasting, traditional AM radio broadcasting, because although it's um, in fairly rapid decline, um, networks are being switched off, it still replains um, a place as a, a bit of a niche service um, and is attractive for providing uniform coverage over quite large areas using a small number of transmitters. So though in, in most urban areas um, and most uh, developed countries, it's, um, it's rapidly becoming obsolescent. Um, in some areas, particularly coverage around uh, thinly populated areas or islands, uh, it still has a, a role over the next few years probably. Um, and it's attractive uh, as a way of providing coverage over uh, sparsely populated areas quite uh, efficiently. Uh, and just to illustrate this, in the UK, uh, 23 transmitters provide um, a national service at medium wave uh, compared with a, a total of around uh, of over 200 transmitters to provide the equivalent FM service uh, while DAB uh, needs around 400 transmitters to provide a national service and digital television uh, obviously a very different form of service but uh, that requires, uh, as we saw in the earlier slide, more than a thousand transmitters to provide uh, contiguous geographical coverage. So although the quality of service um, that we're talking about is very different, um, the use of these low frequencies does provide a, a very efficient way to achieve uh, large area coverage very quickly. In propagation generally, you're going to be dealing with uh, a direct wave from transmitter to receiver and a ground reflected wave, which will suffer a, generally a near 180 degree phase change on reflection. And at LF and MF, the, uh, the wavelength is so long that the phase difference um, between the two is, is very close always to 180 degrees. Uh, so you get almost complete cancellation. Uh, and this leaves only the surface wave, which is propagated by ground currents. Um, and the, um, the efficiency of the surface wave falls off very rapidly with increasing frequency. So it's, it's insignificant at VHF and above, um, but very significant at LF and MF. And Sommerfeld and Norton, who worked out the, uh, the, the theory in the early 20th century, um, showed, and it was uh, soon shown, experimentally as well, that uh, LF and MF signals propagate much better over good conductivity ground or uh, particularly over seawater. Uh, very often you'll find MF uh, transmitters located close to the coast um, where they can uh, benefit from these effects. For the prediction of LF and MF propagation um, is an ITUR recommendation P368, which provides a sets of curves for the, uh, the prediction of ground wave propagation. Um, 
And unlike uh, the VHF and UHF case, uh, you can predict the, uh, the field strength at a given point really quite precisely because the, uh, the impact of local clutter uh, and uh, differences in terrain tends to be far less significant. Uh, and there's also uh, software available from the ITU website, uh, which is the software that was used to construct these curves. Uh, and that can also be obtained and uh, used to um, validate prediction programs or, or the source code can be used directly. The prediction curves we've just seen give the uh, variation of field strength with distance for a specific type of ground conductivity, but uh, most um, paths over any uh, reasonable service area are going to include uh, portions with different ground conductivities, perhaps most um, notably if the path crosses uh, sea land boundaries. Uh, and we therefore need to combine the, uh, the two types of propagation. This is usually done uh, using an empirical method um, devised by Millington. Um, and in this method, you calculate the field strength um, in both directions separately. So in uh, a first pass, you assume the transmitter is uh, at one end of the path, uh, perhaps initially uh, crossing the sea with a relatively small attenuation. Uh, and then from that point on, uh, you assume it suffers a higher attenuation as it crosses a land path. Uh, the dotted lines here represent the, uh, the attenuation if the sea path had continued or if the path had been all over land. Uh, and this gives you uh, an overall field strength for the two portions of the path uh, in the forward direction. But then if you uh, reverse the process and assume the transmitters at the other end of the path uh, and you calculate the field strength first across land and then across sea, uh, you end up with a a rather different field strength and, and obviously in practice uh, we know from uh, physics that uh, all propagation paths should be reciprocal uh, and so it's found that uh, the empirical uh, solution for this sort of mixed path is to take the uh, the geometrical mean of these two field strengths the forward prediction and the reverse prediction um, or that's just the, um, the arithmetic mean if you're working in terms of decibels. One of the problems of uh, LF and MF broadcasting is the variation in the coverage area you get between night and day uh, caused by changes in the, uh, the Earth's ionosphere uh, as it's uh, ionized by the, uh, the sun. Uh, during the daytime, the uh, ionization extends quite a long way down through the atmosphere to the, uh, the D layer which uh, starts to about 50 kilometers above the ground. And this layer has the effect of strongly absorbing lower frequency radio waves. So uh, any uh, energy uh, traveling upwards from an MF transmitter uh, gets quickly attenuated by this layer. But at night time, as you lose the energy from the sun, the ionization at, at this level fades and the uh, LF or MF energy can penetrate up to the higher ionized layers, the E layer and the F layer. Uh, and it's reflected from these layers to return to the ground uh, as a so-called sky wave. So you get um, an intermediate skip distance where, uh, where there is no sky wave. Uh, and then beyond a few tens of kilometers, um, you get both the ground wave and the, um, the reflected sky wave. Because the ionosphere is constantly in motion, the phase relationship between the ground wave and the sky wave is, uh, is very variable. And so uh, where you've got the two signals at roughly the same intensity, you get uh, strong uh, interference, uh, one moment constructive and next moment destructive and uh, with terrible phase distortion of the audio. So the, uh, the service area uh, of the transmitter defined by the ground wave in daytime at nighttime will shrink um, to a relatively small radius. Um, also, of course, beyond the, uh, the interference zone, um, you enter an area where the ground wave has fallen to uh, a low value and you can uh, receive quite a good signal uh, from the sky wave alone. So this has the uh, effect of extending the service area greatly. Uh, but this is usually of, uh, of no benefit because frequency planning means that other uh, 
stations beyond the nominal service area will be using those frequencies and so there'll be mutual interference either between the sky waves of those stations or the ground waves of those stations so the net effect is to um, to shrink the service areas of, uh, of most stations using the band uh, during the night which is uh, a real problem for service planning the only way to mitigate this sort of interference is really to try to discriminate against the sky wave uh, by changing the antenna pattern and that's very hard to do uh, given the size of antennas uh, at these frequencies if you have a small antenna um, as shown in the uh, the first diagram here the vertical radiation pattern uh, is extremely broad and as you can see it really uh, if anything it discriminates against the ground wave um, and it certainly uh, doesn't reject uh, incoming uh, sky wave radiation at higher elevation angles uh, you can improve the situation somewhat if you um, use larger antennas and as you move um, towards uh, an antenna height of about half a wavelength uh, which is obviously a pretty substantial structure at these frequencies uh, you can sharpen the response of the antenna somewhat and reject some of the sky wave energy This variability and uh, mutual interference was one of the, uh, the drivers for the move to uh, VHF and UHF frequencies. Uh, but the first use of those frequencies uh, for uh, original TV services in the 1930s and 40s was, uh, was of course the access to uh, the greater bandwidth uh, that was needed for television. Um, and the upper frequency limit at the time was determined by the uh, ease with which you could generate uh, power from the transmitters and the uh, receiver uh, noise level and sensitivity which was constrained by the, um, by the thermionic valves that were available at the time and but even at those low VHF frequencies you could start to implement some uh, modest antenna gain and discrimination uh, both in the, uh, the horizontal and the vertical radiation pattern and the fact that you could now make use of both horizontal and vertical polarization uh, unlike the case at um, MF and long wave um, where it's only the, the vertically polarized wave that propagates over the ground uh, this polarization discrimination allowed you to uh, reuse frequencies um, over a shorter distance than you'd otherwise been able to do the main thing people had to get used to in exploiting these frequencies was the the strong dependence of path loss on the details of terrain um, so there's a much higher level of uh, variability over a small area uh, than people have been used to uh, in planning mf and lf services uh, much more fading and you also needed to start to consider the relationship between the uh, the direct and reflected components of the space wave so although I no longer have to consider reflections from the ionosphere the sky wave with its, its very unpredictable phase relationship um, you do need to consider uh, what's going on between the um, the wave that uh, propagates directly from the transmitter to the receiving antenna which is likely to be uh, uh, certainly for these early broadcast services on top of the house and the uh, the ground reflected component So at, um, at VHF frequencies, even ground covered with um, houses and cars and trees and so on looks um, relatively uh, smooth in radio terms because the wavelengths are so long, it's sort of six or seven meters or so. And um, this makes the ground look smooth and supports uh, specular uh, reflections of the energy and the interference between the direct and reflected waves uh, means that the height gain is quite predictable at these frequencies when the um, energy is reflected from the ground it undergoes a 180 degree phase shift so for paths that are very close um, re receiving antennas that are very close to the ground the uh, direct and reflected um, ray paths have almost the same path length so there's a 180 degree difference between them uh, and the energy more or less cancels um, and this is particularly the case for um, 
for horizontal polarization, vertical polarization um, indicated in this diagram, which shows the reflection uh, curves as you increase the angle above the horizon, uh, is much more variable. Uh, but the end result is that for the lower VHF frequencies, um, as you move away from the ground, you move away from a, a position where the two, uh, two waves more or less cancel and you have a very predictable um, height gain. Uh, as you move up in frequency to um, the FM broadcast band in band 2, 88 megahertz or so, uh, and then into the higher VHF range and then certainly the UHF broadcast band, uh, the ground starts to look far less smooth and you don't get the same sort of specular reflections. And so you lose um, this very um, definite relationship between uh, height above ground and um, and the height gain, the relative phase relationship of the directed and reflected waves. But you still see the same sort of height gain as you move the antenna up, simply because you're getting clear of all the local obstructions and the, uh, the diffraction losses caused by neighbouring hills and buildings. So the mechanism is a bit different uh, and the variability is greater, but as you move up in frequency, you still see uh, a strong height gain. Uh, and reflected energy um, not only has to be considered in terms of the impact it has on the, uh, the overall signal level, but also in terms of um, things like ghost images on TV or, or multipath distortion on FM radio. Uh, and this is one of the great advantages of uh, digital systems using uh, the SUFDM technology that we talked about earlier, uh, that you're able to reject um, a lot of this multipath energy or make constructive use of the multipath energy. Um, and for analog TV services, the, uh, the, the initial growth in, uh, in wind turbines was quite a problem in terms of uh, producing ghost images. That's now far less of a problem as far as uh, digital TV is concerned. Where it is a problem, of course, is still uh, with things like radar systems uh, that are intended to um, respond to reflected energy and uh, there the location of wind turbines can cause real problems. For the initial planning of uh, VHF services, the sort of empirical models I mentioned earlier um, were quite widely used um, and these are enshrined in ITU recommendation uh, P1546, which consists of the uh, sort of set of uh, tabulated set of curves that you see um, in the figure here. And these just show um, the way in which field strength uh, varies over distance, the median field strength varies over distance uh, for an assumed uh, transmitter of a nominal uh, one kilowatt for different transmitter heights, uh, for different percentages of time and for different environments and frequencies. So there's a whole, whole set of curves that you can look up. Uh, and these gave useful models for initial planning, but um, they're now mostly relevant uh, and used for international coordination because with the, the move to UHF, the coverage, uh, service area coverage became much more fractured. Um, at the higher frequencies, diffraction losses become much more important. So you tend to get uh, deeper shadows behind every, um, every hill, every change in terrain. Um, and this implies that you need more detailed models. So uh, some of the models that have been developed since then, um, those that the BBC uh, developed that are used in the UK, um, the model of Longley Rice in the US and some of the ITU models, recommendation 1812, for instance, these start to take um, physics into account in terms of uh, trying to predict diffraction loss. Uh, so they, they tend to be a blend of a physical model and a statistical model um, that takes in terrain data and information about environmental clutter to improve the, uh, the predictions that are made. Uh, and in the plots you can see below, showing the, these show coverage of um, UHF TV services in the, uh, the southeast of England. And you can see that the uh, original uh, band one uh, 40 to 60 megahertz television service um, used a single transmitter in London of high power uh, with quite a small number of relay stations to fill in uh, the gaps in coverage. But with the move to, uh, to UHF frequencies, around 500 megahertz, uh, you've got much stronger diffraction losses um, 
and the requirement for a much larger number of uh, relay transmitters dotted around throughout the service area. And uh, another thing that needs to be taken into account in VHF and UHF propagation, you don't really see in, uh, in medium wave and long wave propagation, is very great uh, variability with, with weather conditions. And this is particularly the case as you move up in frequency into the, the UHF range, um, where changes in the, uh, in the troposphere, in the, the lower levels of the atmosphere with weather, um, changes in the refractive index can uh, cause very great enhancements of, of distant signals. You end up with um, the radio equivalent of a mirage, uh, as one illustrated here, um, showing objects beyond the horizon that uh, suddenly become visible due to the, uh, the bending of uh, waves in the atmosphere. And the same thing happens uh, to radio signals, which means that you suddenly get uh, very large enhancements of, um, of signals for very short uh, percentages of time. Uh, and the plot here shows um, over a month uh, in the summer in the UK, uh, the enhancement of signals, the um, blue curve as signals arriving from France into the UK over the English Channel um, and the, the red curve shows signals coming from the North Sea uh, and you can see that in some days in the summer when the uh, when high pressure conditions prevailed and um, you had the conditions that lead to to layering of the troposphere and ducting conditions the signal could be enhanced by by up to 60 dBs or so over a 200 kilometer path and so you need to allow for this enormous variability, the fact that interference from very distant stations can suddenly increase by a, a very large amount. Uh, and particularly with digital systems, uh, this causes a problem because it's, uh, it may not be apparent to the, uh, the viewer or listener why their, their screen has gone blank or their digital radio service has stopped. They will tend to assume it's a problem with the equipment, uh, when in practice it's a, a problem with propagation uh, and perhaps inadequate um, margins uh, to allow for these enhancements. So um, the variability of, uh, of propagation is a, a very large problem for the, uh, the service planner to take into account. As I said at the start, the uh, simplest way to provide coverage to um, a roughly circular service area is just to place the transmitter in the middle of that area and use uh, an omnidirectional antenna and if we're talking about a low power service uh, you can use a, a simple low gain omnidirectional antenna to provide that service um, but that needs to be on top of the support structure um, for a low power radio station it's quite likely to be uh, on top of a block of flats or something and there's no problem but um, that can be difficult if you're uh, trying to get access to a telecoms tower where uh, not only is the, uh, the top of the tower likely to be cluttered with other users but uh, it's also likely to be the most expensive uh, place to install an antenna. Uh, more generally it's quite likely that the uh, transmitter site will be off to one side of the service area uh, so the path losses will be slightly larger um, across the service area but that's compensated for by the fact that you're going to need uh, to use a directional antenna to uh, concentrate the energy in the direction you want. So you might use something like a, a set of collinear antennas or a, a, a Yagi antenna uh, to beam the energy towards the desired service area. Uh, but this ignores uh, interference and very often um, that's going to constrain the sort of antenna design you use. So for uh, more powerful or more complex broadcast sites, it's quite likely that there'll be limitations on the amount of power that you can radiate uh, in particular directions. Uh, and the uh, example graphs shown here, the plots here, um, are antenna radiation templates taken from uh, BBC examples uh, that are available on the web. And these show, the dotted lines show that the, uh, the maximum power that can be radiated in uh, particular azimuths from a given transmitter site to avoid causing interference to other services. Um, so you need to design uh, an antenna that may have quite a complicated radiation pattern to fit within uh, this template. Uh, 
Uh, and the usual way you'll do that is by arranging for um, panels, antenna panels, to be um, installed on a mast uh, facing in different directions and fed uh, with power from the transmitter that's um, fed with an appropriate phase and amplitude relationship to synthesize um, the arbitrary patterns that you want to create. Uh, and you can do this in the, the horizontal plane as shown here. So this is looking down on a mast uh, and you have standard panel antennas uh, arranged around the mast uh, with a splitter taking the power from the transmitter to feed it to each of the panel antennas. Um, and in this example, uh, you'll perhaps feed this panel with the, uh, the greatest amount of power to produce this main lobe, but you're also trying to synthesize uh, lobes in the other direction. Um, and perhaps make sure there are nulls at other azimuths to uh, protect against creating interference in other service areas. And this is done by, by careful design of the, the phasing network. And you can do the same thing in the, uh, the vertical radiation pattern. This is just looking sideways on one of these panels, perhaps. Uh, and each panel may be composed of, uh, of several dipole elements or cross dipole elements, depending on the uh, uh, polarization. Uh, fed with an appropriate phase relationship to concentrate the power um, generally near the horizon but perhaps uh, slightly below it to avoid uh, propagating interference uh, into other service areas and also to make sure the coverage uh, below the mast is, uh, is adequate. So we've talked about how to plan a network to transmit uh, appropriate signals to provide the uh, required uh, quality of coverage to viewers and listeners. But we also need to get the signals to the transmitters in that network. Um, and traditionally, the largest transmitters would have been fed um, directly from the studios through coaxial, fiber or, or satellite networks. And um, there'd obviously be a modulator at the transmitter to take the ba baseband signal, uh, be it analog or digital, um, and modulate it onto the appropriate carrier. Um, and then the remaining sites in the network would make use of uh, signals received off air from those main stations um, through uh, rebroadcast links, RBLs. So they'd receive the signal directly off air. And then generally the signal wouldn't be demodulated, it would simply be transposed to uh, another frequency within the band of interest. And although increasingly uh, more sites are likely to be fed by satellite or fiber as the, uh, those distribution networks become more extensive uh, and cheaper, uh, it's still the case that RBL is going to be used for a lot of the smaller sites. Um, for instance, in the UK, the, uh, the thousand odd relays for the digital TV service, uh, and the majority of those uh, pick up their signals from a parent station off air and uh, retransmit them uh, generally on another channel. And that's quite a constraint on, on site selection. You need to make sure not only that your, your target site can see the service area that it's trying to provide a service into, but also that it's somewhere uh, that can receive um, a reliable signal from the, uh, uh, the parent station um, which is usually not too difficult, but you also need to make sure that signal is protected against interference from other stations in the network for the appropriate percentage of time. And the fact that you're using a, a transposer to shift the frequency within the band may limit the choice of the, uh, the transmit channel you have available. Uh, you may need to make sure the transmit channel is separated by a certain uh, frequency offset from the channel on which you're receiving. Though uh, nowadays, on-channel repeaters have started to appear that include uh, some extremely cunning digital echo cancellation that allows you to receive and transmit on the same channel. Um, it does also impose uh, some constraints on the on how close the transmit and receive antennas at that site can be. You need to ensure that there's a, a certain degree of isolation uh, between those. Uh, and another constraint uh, is that you also need a, an accurate time reference for uh, sites operating in single frequency networks, particularly in, uh, in DAB networks, but also where SFNs may be used for, uh, for digital television. And this is generally de derived from uh, GPS signals. So those are all technical considerations 
but it's very rare for a, um, a service planning engineer to be able to um, to base uh, site selection purely on uh, technical considerations uh, and in practice you'll often find that you have to adopt a compromise site uh, one of the most expensive issues certainly in rural areas is making sure there's a reliable power supply um, to the site under consideration and although you can use solar and wind power uh, that also puts demand uh, on things like um, uh, battery storage which may be a uh, very expensive uh, consideration if it's um, going to be sufficiently reliable uh, then there are the, the commercial issues of site acquisition um, consideration of rental costs uh, and in some cases you may need some extensive groundwork um, and you may need to make sure that you've got reliable access tracks you may need to provide reliable access tracks for 24-hour um, access by maintenance crews um, and we mentioned uh, briefly uh, program feeds so uh, they may also end up constraining the uh, the selection of uh, particular sites looking forward at the end of this uh, this brief survey of um, broadcast transmission technology is probably the case that uh, LF and MF uh, broadcasting is is dying out uh, one of the reasons for that is simply that receivers are going to be increasingly hard to find it's um, it's a long time since I've seen a receiver uh, in a high street shop that covers uh, the medium and long wave bands um, but there are some niche markets that uh, will continue to see these services for some time um, as a company we've been involved in uh, in planning radio coverage in some small and remote islands and uh, LF and MF broadcasting is, is very attractive uh, in cases like that particularly if the uh, the land is at all rugged um, but they're also going to face competition not only from uh, other forms of broadcast transmission uh, like FM and DAB but also from the increasing ubiquity of, of 4G and 5G VHF radio on the other hand FM radio doesn't seem to be going anywhere anytime soon um, although uh, it has been switched off in Norway with some controversy um, in most other countries people are talking about analog switch off but uh, I think it's probably quite a, a brave political decision to um, to enforce this in a short time scale um, there's no other obvious use for the spectrum so it seems likely that if um, licensed broadcasters uh, close down their use of the spectrum that it would be occupied uh, very rapidly by pirate broadcasters um, it has the merit of being cheap and ubiquitous there's a very low cost of entry for broadcasters but again listening habits uh, are changing and uh, as I say the competition may well end up coming from uh, 4G and 5G mobile services uh, digital terrestrial television <clears throat> again this is um, a service whose audience is shrinking um, not only do most households now have access to um, OTT over the top services provided over uh, broadband connections which provide uh, a very large range of channels compared with uh, that that's available by DTT um, but also there's great pressure on uh, on broadcasters for spectrum release and the uh, the repurposing of uh, the UHF spectrum in particular for uh, for 5G and 4G services and this raises the uh, the question of whether uh, all these broadcast services could be provided uh, over 5G networks we've all seen uh, slides showing the almost infinite uh, reconfigurability of, of 5G uh, networks to provide anything from uh, machine to machine communications and ultra reliable low bitrate communications to to very high um, bandwidth broadband services uh, and certainly the um, the coverage in, in, even in rural areas of um, 4G and 5G services it, is expanding fast I think whatever the future of uh, broadcast networks having survived for um, 
100 years or so, there's going to be a need uh, for some time to come to, uh, to plan and to replan and implement and maintain uh, traditional broadcast networks. So I hope this webinar has given you um, a brief overview of some of the things we need to think about um, in uh, planning broadcast tr terrestrial transmission. There's obviously an enormous amount of information available online, but a couple of particularly um, detailed and authoritative sources are um, the uh, technical part of the EBU website and uh, the, uh, the publications, uh, the broadcasting publications, recommendations and reports of the, of the ITU, uh, where broadcasting falls under the um, responsibility of, of study group six of the ITUR. Uh, so I'll just leave you with a, a holiday picture uh, taken while site testing UHF frequencies uh, in Scotland this year. And um, thank you for uh, watching this webinar. And um, if you have any, uh, any requirements um, or any questions about the content, uh, do feel free to get in touch with me at the, uh, at the address shown. Thanks very much.